I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, Prince of Peace, healer of our brokenness, and hope of the world. As I stand before you here for the second year, my heart is overflowing with joy and thanksgiving for the exceptional opportunity of serving God and God's people called United Methodist of the Susquehanna Annual Conference. God has been faithful and God's people have been gracious. Lisa and I would like to express our heartfelt appreciation for your warming hospitality that we were privileged to receive when we visited places throughout the conference. We love Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> and the Susquehanna Annual Conference. We continue to enjoy living in your midst. Indeed, we found a home here in Harrisburg area. Thanks be to God for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The story of Esther, Esther is so intriguing. It's a story with multiple plots, memorable lines, fascinating characters, intense suspense, powerful moments, dramatic reversals, unlike conclusion, and best of all, a happy ending. To me, most pivotal and watershed moment in the story is Mordecai's plea on behalf of God's time and Esther's decision in response. He says to Esther, who knows, but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. In other words, Esther, this is God's time for you to act for the sake of the future of God's people. This is the time and you are the one. Fully knowing what, me, what it means to go to the king without prior permission, Esther replies, I will go to the king even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. In other words, I am here for this moment, even though it well could cost her life. Esther claims that it is the time to approach the king and she is the one. Ecclesiastes says that there is a time for everything. Jesus once said, my time has not yet come. He also said at another time, Father, the time has come. Indeed, there's God's time for God's purpose. What time is it for our church? The United Methodist Church is going through the most challenging and painful conflict of our time over the issue of same gender marriage. Churches of our conference cannot be insulated from this effect. Recently, same-gender marriage has become legal in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Among the people in our church, as well as in the general public, this change of law certainly gives a reason for celebration for some, causes frustration for some, and raises confusion for some. Church law remains the same. It does allow same-gender marriages to be performed by clergy or on church property. However, the recent developments within and outside of our church heightens the sense of growing uneasiness and anxiety among us. Our church is not a one mind over the issue. The faithful disciples of Jesus Christ who love and serve God with passion, devotion, and integrity honestly have different biblical and theological beliefs and understandings of the issue. People on both sides are hurting and are in pain as brokenness and divisiveness over the issue continue to deepen and widen among the people. The way to build a bridge and keep the unity becomes ever more challenging. People in some circles have now begun to use words like amicable separation. We see a dark cloud forming over the horizon in the shape of an S-word, schism. God's people, we are called to be a church for such a time as this. Recently, I read an article written by a young clergy of our conference in response to the emerging voices of schism. His plea was, it's time to talk. It resonated deeply with me. When such an explosive topic as schism in our connection 
over such a divisive issue as same-gender marriage is brewing and spilling all over the place, simply to remain silent is not an option. When the brokenness hurts and harms people, it's the time to talk. When the divisiveness threatens the unity and peace of the church, it's the time to talk. When the foundation of our common covenant is in serious jeopardy, it's the time to talk. When the future path of our church is at stake, it's the time to talk. As your bishop, I propose that a sacred space be created where our people can come and open themselves to one another in trust and have a holy conversation. Before approaching the king, Esther commits herself to a time of deep prayer and fasting. She also asks her whole community to fast with her. A time to talk is a time to pray. When God's people are gathered in a sacred space of trust and pray together and talk together in the spirit of compassion, gentleness, humility, openness, honesty, and integrity, and with respect and love for one another. God will take charge and God will show us the way. Let's put our trust in the God who called us to be a church for such a time as this. Today's scripture readings are powerfully relevant to our current struggle. God's people of the Susquehanna Annual Conference, take heart. God is faithful. God who gives us endurance and encouragement is with us. Though we may go through the ordeal of disagreement, we do not lose a spirit of unity. Though we may th not think alike, we follow one Lord Jesus Christ. Though we may not believe exactly the same way, we glorify God with one heart and mouth. Though we may not, we may have differences, we accept one another as Christ accepts you and me. Jesus reminds us that the world will know us as his disciples, not by taking certain biblical, theological, and doctrinal positions, but by our love for one another. Whatever position we may take, let the love arise and reach to the other side. That's the witness we are called to give to the world for such a time as this. It is my hope and prayer that the world will say of us someday, look at those people called the United Methodists. They have disagreements among them. They show differences with one another. But see how they still accept one another. Look how they still love one another. They must be disciples of Jesus Christ. By God's grace, together, we will hasten the day. While we seek a way to overcome the most challenging issue of our time, let's not lose perspective. The mission of the church remains the same, to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Knowing that the current conflict can drain the spirit, energy, and resources that are essential to keep the body of Christ healthy and strong for mission, I refuse to be consumed by the conflict. The mission of the church is larger than whatever causes the conflict. The mission of the church demands and deserves our unsurpassing commitment with a sense of urgency, priority, and focus more than any other. So here we are. So Squan Annual Conference gathered once again under the theme of Alive in Christ Together, Raising Up Transformational Leaders. So we ask, who are the transformational leaders? How do we raise up transformational leaders? Why transformation? We know that our church is having a tough time. The environment of our culture continues to grow to be unfavorable to us. Churches are in fierce competition with other attractions and activities. Sports have become the dominant religion in America. 
The fastest growing segment of the current religious landscape is called the nuns, who claim themselves spiritual, but not interested, if not hostile, to the church or organized religion. The absence of young adults and the dwindling presence of youth and children in our congregations paint a bleak future of our church. This is no easy time for us to be a church. Transformation in the life and ministry of our church is not optional for such a time as this. A complacent church has a little future. Business as usual will not work. Indeed, for some churches, no change now means no future. We still have sizable numbers of faithful people who have been with our church for a long time and will continue to be with our church for some time. Thanks be to God for them. However, more and more congregations are facing the ever-increasing challenge of sustaining their current status of being and doing the church. The channel of receiving new people to make up those who move away or die away in a rapid pace is getting narrower. A demographic study suggests an impending death tsunami among those who have been with our church so faithfully for a long time. Then, what will happen to our church? As most churches are slowly losing their presence in the community and its potency in ministry with a continuing loss of membership, worship attendance, ministry engagement, and financial resources, what can be done before it is too late? Thanks be to God that we have many churches that have turned around and are turning around. Hear this. About one-third of the churches of the Susquehanna Annual Conference experienced growth in membership and worship attendance last year. We have churches of all sizes in all different places that continue to be vital and vibrant as they keep producing the fruit of ministry in abundance. They represent the presence of hope among us. Leaders in such churches are transformational. A substantial and sustainable transformation of our church does not come with programs and resources. It comes with transformational leaders who serve as catalysts for transformation by making some critical shifts take place and take hold. Some shifts are essential to transformation. I would like to suggest that we start with a culture shift, a shift from a culture of low expectancy to a culture of high expectancy. A different expectation brings different results. When little is expected, you get little. When much is expected, you get much. Jesus expected to get from his disciples not just Jerusalem, not just Judea, not just Samaria, but the whole world, and he got the world. When anyone is baptized as a child of God, confirmed as a disciple of Jesus Christ, and received as a member of the United Methodist Church, let's not be apologetic for or shy away from making our expectations emphatic and clear. People will never fulfill their potential as disciples of Jesus Christ if they are not clear and serious about what is expected from them. The book of discipline has these words in it. There was no place for those whom Wesley called the almost Christians. I believe that no one should stay long in a place of almost pastor or almost United Methodist. Every pastor is expected to be the best pastor he or she can be. Every United Methodist is expected to be the best disciple he or she can be. Clergy and laity alike, all of us are expected to be the best ministers of the gospel we can be who strive to reach the expectation that God has for us. Along with a cultural shift from low expectations to high expectations, I call upon our church to make a few critical transformational shifts. Once again, they are not about programs. 
They are about the fundamental reorientation of being and doing the church by challenging and changing our priorities, values, and attitudes. They are shifts, one, from a maintenance priority to a mission priority. It's, it's about reclaiming the mission of the church, the purpose of our existence as a church of Jesus Christ. Two, from inwardly focused ministry to outwardly focused ministry. It's about making the intentional investment of ministry resources for the community and its people. Three, from making members to making disciples. It's about connecting our people to a faith journey and to a movement rather than to a church as an institution. So first, from a maintenance priority to a mission priority. A growing number of our churches are searching for answers that can help them stay vital and viable, not just barely making it. There is no simple or easy answer. However, one thing is clear to me. Unless people are excited, passionate, and enthused about the ministry of the church, motivating existing people, attracting new people, and thus drawing more resources for ministry will be unlikely. When people are preoccupied with keeping the doors open to survive and with building maintenance as priority, they are hardly excited and enthused for who they are and what they do as a church. Claiming mission as a priority by connecting the congregation to life-changing, soul-saving, community-redeeming, and world transformation, missions changes the tide. <laughs> A man was driving home. While driving, he was listening to his favorite music station. At one point, the disc jockey asked the audience, when was the last time you brought flowers to your wife? The driver thought that it would be a good idea because he couldn't remember the last time he had. It must have been a long, long time ago. <laughs> so he dropped by a florist and bought a beautiful bouquet of flowers. He pulled his car in the gar garage and went to the front door and rang the bell. As his wife opened the door, he offered the bouquet with a big smile on his face. He said, this is for you. His wife with a surprised look and said, Oh no, today I had such a rough day. Jimmy was sick, so I had to take him to the doctor. Tommy was in trouble in school, so I had to go to school to meet the principal. The washing machine broke, and now you come home drunk. God's people of Susquehanna and your conference, I would like you to know that as far as making mission a priority is concerned, there are people who may think this bishop is coming to you drunk. <laughs> I am willing to do something more, something extra, something unusual, and even something extraordinary as needed to keep our church alive in mission. <laughs> Knowing that more mission would mean more lives touched, transformed and even saved in the name and love of Jesus Christ, I'm willing to extend myself beyond the ordinary. Susquehanna Conference, we must refuse to be a maintenance-driven church and boldly claim to be a mission-driven church for such a time as this. So, <laughs> second, from inwardly focused ministry to outwardly focused ministry. Whether we thrive or wither as a congregation largely depends on our capacity of making connections with the people in the community. We know that. But where does the breakthrough come from? It comes from a radical shift of our ministry focus from inward to outward. I have watched our congregations shrink smaller and smaller, and the one common but significant factor that those congregations have in common is a decreasing engagement from their neighborhood. They become focused more and more on themselves and their survival. This is a trap that we must escape from. As long as we continue to look to our own needs first and exhaust our resources for us, we become more like a self-preserving institution and less like a movement 
that reaches out and touches and transforms lives. This is a downward spiral we must break. Our ministries must keep more attention to and focus on those who are not yet with us in our church, and our resources must be invested to serve the needs of our community. Let's be reminded that our pastors are appointed to the community as well as to a congregation, a vital congregation where the community makes a vital congregation. Did I say it right? Vital connection <laughs> with the community makes a vital congregation. Radical shift from inward to outward turns the church around. It is a transformational movement that we cannot afford to lose. Third, a shift from making members to making disciples. There was a time when most people would want church membership without hesitation. People found our churches everywhere and came through the door for themselves by drove. No longer. Now for many people within and outside the church, church membership doesn't mean much. Sadly, membership is associated primarily with one's privileges and minimum obligation instead of with one's commitments and responsibilities. The most disturbing thing about this is, for some, church membership has little to do with a journey of faith as disciples of Jesus Christ. Church membership is not inherently wrong However, there is a difference in membership and discipleship. Membership is defined by its relationship with an organization. Discipleship is defined by its relationship with a person, Jesus Christ. Membership has maintenance as its priority. Discipleship has mission as its priority. Membership has its primary focus on care of the members. Discipleship has its primary focus on ministry for others. Membership is oriented inward for institutional interests. Discipleship is oriented outward for the transformation of the world. The future of our church will be determined by its ability to regain its identity as a movement. Making members may make a church survive as an institution for some time, but making disciples will keep a church alive as a movement for the transformation of the world until the day of Christ. For too long, as an established church, we have focused on instructing people to become good members rather than nurturing, equipping, and having the expectation that people will become committed disciples. It's time to make a shift. The mission of the church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ in the first place. Let the church say amen. Who shall be the leaders who will lead our church to make these transformational shifts? There have always been God's transformational leaders for every period in God's time. God has never left us as orphans with no one to guide and lead us in the journey. If we know anything about the character of God, we know that God is faithful. God has always been and will always be faithful. As I stand before you today and look across this sea of faces numbering some 1,500 people of God, I realize that transformational leaders are already here. They are within this room and within the churches of Susquehanna Annual Conference. We do not have to wait until some people arrive or until Christ, uh, God provides someone else. What God has already provided, my brothers and sisters in Christ, you and I are the ones God has called and sent to make a difference for such a time as this. Let the church say amen. amen. I deeply resonate with the words that I heard at one of the district laity days this year. The best way to make Disciples of Jesus Christ is to become one. Likewise, the best way to raise up transformational leaders is to become one. The most compelling leadership is leading by example. An optimist would say, somehow somebody will do it. A pessimist would say, under no circumstances, nobody will do it. A disciple would say, here I am. Who
Who are the transformational leaders? Who will raise up transformational leaders? God's people look in the mirror. You are the one God has called for such a time as this. You are the one our church is looking for for such a time as this. I stand ready to partner with you, the laity and clergy of Susquehanna and your conference, to be a church alive together, raising up transformational leaders for such a time as this. The God whom I worship and serve fills me with hope that we will meet the challenge of our time. I will keep prepared to give compelling answers to those who ask the reasons for hope that we have. The God who raised Jesus from the dead is the reason for hope. The reason Christ who is here with us is another reason for hope. You, God's people of Susquehanna and your conference, are yet another reason for the hope that we have. Together, we are the reason for hope that our God has for our church and for the world for such a time as this. This is our time. We are the ones. Amen. Amen. May God richly bless you. Thank you. God bless you.